So welcome everyone back to Open Planetary Virtual Lunch, or if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, this is going to be a recurring series that Open Planetary is going to run. Uh, right now, we're starting with a monthly basis, and we're going to be looking to find speakers on all topics related to Open Planetary Science. Uh, so our main topics uh, have to do with data, tools, open source software, and if anyone out there has projects or interesting tools or tutorials to share with us, uh, we want to hear from you. So definitely get in touch with myself, Indu, Chase, uh, and um, yeah, chat with us about maybe having a future spot on our lunch talk series. So quickly about the lunch. I know it's not lunch all around the world for everyone. Uh, this is just supposed to be a sort of an informal brown bag style talk series uh, where we can hear from the community and the community can share what they've been working on um, with the rest of us. So we're really excited to reopen this series with Steve Cropper from NASA HQ. And Steve is the senior program executive for data and computing in the science mission directorate at NASA. He's the lead for open source science initiative and led the development of SMD's scientific information policy. Uh, he has worked a bunch with uh, Hubble and James Webb. Um, and he's a founding member of AstroPy, uh, which probably most of us has heard of, open source Python library, maybe one of the biggest uh, scientific Python libraries out there. Um, he's also a former scientific editor at AAS, and he has a focus on software and machine learning. So Steve will be talking to us about what's been going on with open source software and open science at NASA. Um, and quickly, before we get started, I'll just remind everyone, in case you haven't already, to connect with us either on uh, Slack, and we'll post the links for all of this in the chat. Um, but there's an open planetary Slack, in case you're unaware. Um, there's also a forum where we post uh, lots of things related to open planetary, um, sometimes job postings as well. And then open planetary is now also on LinkedIn. So if that's uh, where you spend most of your time in the, in the metaverse, uh, connect with us over on LinkedIn too. So we'll post links for this in the chat, but without any further ado, we'll uh, hand it over to Steve. Well, thank you so much, Christian, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I didn't realize I was kicking off the new series, um, and so hopefully uh, this will be a, a good start to the new series, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to uh, possibly looking at some of the, the future talks. Um, and so yeah, I'm joining today to talk about open source software and open science at NASA. Um, I'm Steve Crawford, uh, and I'm part of the overall chief office of the chief science data officer. Um, and I'll jump right into the, the slides. Uh, there, hopefully, there, there we go. And so I'll talk about software and NASA, um, some of the, the successes and challenges with open source software, and then also our open science implementation. Um, you know, I, I probably don't need to, to introduce NASA to many people in this audience. Um, but I always like to show this image um, from one of the uh, Apollo moon landings, uh, showing that our, um, you know, NASA's goals and, and part of our, our mission is both, um, you know, exploration and discovery. And, you know, this is a great example um, of Neil Armstrong on the moon doing also an experiment on the solar winds. And so uh, with all of our exploration also comes the scientific discovery and scientific experiments that we do. And as part of that, and as part of that, and as um, all of our um, uh, missions and all the scientific discovery that we do, um, software is such an, a key and important part of that. Here's an example of the um, open source Apollo software. Um, and we've been making software and our discoveries as part of the initial uh, Space Act um, openly available and, and as part of our even founding mission. And so 
Um, and from very early on, from Mary Jackson working on our computers or Margaret, Margaret Hamilton leading the development of the Apollo software, um, we've always been, uh, uh, and, and so much of NASA's mission has always been so closely tied to computing and the development of software that it's just an integral part of what we do. Even so much the, to the aspect of sharing what we do is part of NASA's Foundational Space Act. Um, and so one of the aspects of it is providing for the widest practical and appropriate dissemination of information considering its activities and results thereof. And so NASA has been sharing um, our discoveries uh, since our initial founding. And there are still a lot of examples of how we actually continue to share those discoveries um, across the three different uh, themes that the Science Mission Directorate as part of NASA works on. And that's to protect and improve life on Earth and space, search for life elsewhere, and discover secrets of the universe. We do this through our, our range of missions, um, and we always actually have more missions which are both in development and being launched. Um, so it's often difficult to keep this uh, flight chart up to date. Um, you can see the wide range of different Earth science and International Space Station experiments. Um, also our astrophysics missions, uh, looking at the wide range of um, uh, of different um, missions, but probably particularly um, applicable to this group is certainly our planetary missions being led by the Planetary Science Division uh, to our, our various uh, planets and bodies uh, around the solar system. And there's a lot of great um, examples of um, open science and open source software that's made available and as part of these missions. Um, one of my favorite stories is uh, Ingenuity and the Mars Perseverance mission. Um, obviously, uh, probably very familiar to this community. It made its first flight in 2021. And one of the first things, or one of the things that actually really highlights about this mission is that F Prime, its open source uh, flight control software was re released by JPL in 2017. Uh, this software was made openly available um, and uh, applicable to uh, control of and framework for providing flight software. Uh, but one of the many examples of software being made openly available as part of the, the NASA missions, um, which are being produced. Um, and one of the great things, there we go. Whoop. One of the great things about the, the NASA Perseverance mission as well was as part of that um, project, there was also um, uh, partnership with GitHub, which actually went and provided the, the Mars badge. And this recognized the more than 12,000 people that contributed to open source dependencies that were part of the project. Not only does NASA develop its own open source software, but we also depend upon the wide um, environment of uh, open source software, which is actually occurring in the much wider e ecosystem. And this just recognized that as part of our, even our you know, even as one part of an overall project, that there is a very large community in the open source community, uh, which is developing software that NASA depends upon. We also have um, another uh, great open science success story, and um, especially with uh, the open source development of our software, is the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, with um, Webb is a product of multiple different agencies. Um, from around the world and contributions from both Europe, the US and Canada uh, to put together this international collaboration. Um, and it was, um, you know, has been very successful uh, since its launch in 21 um, with uh, some groundbreaking uh, dis discoveries being made as part of it. Uh, one of the very first ones uh, that were actually made available about one month after uh, the data becoming public uh, for the first time was the first evidence of carbon dioxide in exoplanet atmospheres. Um, and one of the things that actually really made this available, um, this was part of our early release science programs, is that um, the open science aspects, which were adopted by these teams, um, in how they actually work to actually make these, these more available. Um, even though uh, this was proposed for uh, by a smaller team many years before as part of the ERS program, uh, the team opened up their, their Slack space and their um, uh, project and, and access to both um, what they were doing to a much larger community with over 400 people um, then ending up participating in, as part of the, the um, activities. 
This allowed um, early analysis of this data by multiple different methods um, to confirm that discovery of CO2. But what helped further uh, manage and make these uh, early observations and discoveries possible was also the availability of the JWST calibration software. Um, this was actually made available as um, developed openly on GitHub. And so it enabled the scientists to actually test their projects and to see what actually uh, was working, what they needed to do more, how they needed to actually um, possibly develop other code to actually help them do the analysis of the data. Uh, but the, the calibration software itself builds on the larger scientific Python environment and also contributes back to it. And one of the uh, examples and one of the things that it really depended upon is the AstroPy project. Um, this provide a common Python library for astronomers and it builds on the NumPy um, library. It started in 2011 from an astronomy and Python mailing list. Um, and so the original contributors include both people from Hubble and Chandra space telescopes, but also uh, contributors from the around the world. Um, it's now been cited in over 10,000 publications and um, making, um, you know, used very widely uh, across the entire astronomy community. Um, you know, and this is actually, you know, just to, 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 to take a moment to kind of interject with my own story in here. Um, as kind of mentioned, um, in 2011, I was actually working in South Africa um, on as part of the Southern African Large Telescope. And um, that's actually when I, you know, was on the mailing list uh, that actually, uh, and, and helped participate and contribute um, to the, the launching of AstroPod. Um, prior to that, you know, um, I was studying objects like this, which is a uh, galaxy cluster. Um, that's what I did for my PhD, where I wrote in a variety of different languages from, from C and Java and Perl and whatever I could do to get the, the job done. Uh, but it was only when I moved to South Africa that I actually started um, writing in Python and they were making their software available as open source. And that's when I learned a lot of the, the processes of making uh, open source software available. Um, and then that led to my involvement with um, uh, the um, AstroPy project. Um, and then my further work on kind of data management and, and open source there um, eventually did actually lead me to actually working on the calibration software for JWST and Hubble. And then that eventually led to my position now in actually helping to advocate for open source software and uh, open science here at NASA headquarters. And so I just kind of wanted to mention that, especially for um, the younger members of the audience of, of um, that uh, career paths can often be uh, very uh, interesting and you never quite know where they might lead you, um, which I have to admit that uh, even uh, five or 10 or 15 years ago, I wouldn't imagine that I'd be doing and and uh, what I've done now or had the opportunity to work with the people and the different groups um, that uh, open source has ended up leading me on that path. Um, and so there is a lot of open source software going on uh, within NASA. Um, due to the nature of earth and space science, software is integral to every step of the scientific process. From the information we gather, um, from space-based detectors to sharing results, um, from planning missions to uh, designing the instruments, uh, and also to sharing the results with the public, um, software becomes and, and open source software are so key to all of those different steps of the process. Um, we use a wide variety of open source software uh, within NASA. This can, um, you know, here we're just mentioning a few of the projects, um, but there are are. A, a significant amount of open source software that we use from a variety of different sources. And as probably many of you already know, there are many advantages to open source so scientific software. It does increase the reproducibility of, of the science which is being done. It enables reuse. Um, other people you know, can build on what pe people have done previously. Um, it also provides ways for curating and archiving the software. Many of this, especially when we're using uh, tools like GitHub, can happen automatically um, to make sure that software is preserved. Um, it provides a better understanding of the results. Um, publications are often um, have so much information on them, but they don't always capture everything which is done. Um, being able to actually read the software associated with a publication really shares about how something was done um, and to actually provide uh, ways to actually comment on it. 
And when we do share it openly, we also have ways and methods for providing credit for how people are actually working on open source software and providing recognition as part of the overall scientific process. And, you know, software, once again, especially in earth and space science, provides such a key part of the scientific process. Um, you know, we have different stages of reproducibility when we're actually talking about software as part of the scientific process. And that, you know, is a paper which might not even mention it's software. You don't actually know what they've done or how they've actually done it. Um, sometimes in a paper, software is mentioned, but not described. So they might say um, that software is development, but not necessarily what it does. Um, papers can include what is described, but maybe they only say it's uh, not made available or only by request. Um, you may follow up with them and they may say, oh, that grad student left a long time ago. I have no idea where that software is now. Um, but then we start actually really getting the stages of, of software and scientific processes being made reproducible, where the software is made openly available and citable. Um, being made openly available with a permissive license helps ensure reusability. Um, and then, you know, if it's possible and if there's time and if it's actually worthwhile, being made available with good documentation and testing um, or being contributed to a larger prop package uh, or generalizable package where it can, if it's appropriate, um, where it can be made more accessible and more reusable uh, to the wider community. And we know when um, software isn't uh, um, shared, uh, there can be challenges in the reproducibility, that the data and plots um, are, are shared and you can see them, but it might not be clear how they were, they were derived. Um, you know, uh, when looking at exact units, was there, is there a fact, extra factor of pi or a conversion unit in there, which might not be clear from how the data are made available. Um, as mentioned, scientists leave the field or the software is lost. Um, and then what was done actually isn't quite clear or understandable. Um, algorithms can be described, but with insufficient detail to reproduce them. And um, configurations or steps are not shared. Um, so I say I, I ran the software, but not how I ran that. What were the parameters used? Um, you know, was it was it a quadratic or a, a or, or another type of um, fitting infection that I used um, that may actually depend on how you make that reproducible. And then also um, whether or not other authors cite the software that they use. Um, this is also important giving credit and understanding in actually what is being done in the paper. Um, fortunately enough, there has been a growing um, uh, uh, ecosystem of tools which actually make uh, doing open science and sharing your software openly more easy uh, uh, or making it easier. And so these include version control platforms like GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket. Um, that actually now make it um, fairly easy to sh share your code openly. Um, we have things like software archiving, like Software Heritage, um, Zenodo, or the Astrophysics Source Code Library, and other sources for actually where you can actually archive and share and discover software. Um, but we've also have a, a growing um, uh, ecosystem of publishing and curation of software. These include things like the Journal of Open Source Software, um, the AAS publications, except papers on software, along with a number of other journals um, as well. And then sources like ADS um, or uh, the science uh, or the um, Science Explorer Science Discovery, which are combining together and linking together uh, data and software as they're made available. At the same time, we know there are challenges with open source software. Um, you know, one of the biggest and one of the, 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 the ones that have been highlighted, especially in the last week is things like sustainability of software uh, and, and uh, whether or not who is actually maintaining that one critical piece of software, which is in your, your overall ecosystem. Uh, training in software, uh, you know, not everyone um, has had a chance to learn about software, uh, having the time to, to actually train in these latest techniques and making those available. Um, and there's always something, and even if you're an expert, there's always something new that you can actually learn. Um, and actually engaging and seeing what other people are doing. Um, licenses can often be complicated, and these are tied together with intellectual property. Um, there are a number of different issues, especially with if a civil servant develops it, or if it's developed you know, by your institute or by a private company and how those are made available. Um, release processes, um, you know, misuse of software, um, even if it's openly available, someone may not read the documentation. Um, and also, um, and you know, as always, a secure uh, a concern is also security. 
um, are what we're doing, um, you know, being done in a secure and appropriate manners, um, both in terms of, you know, safety and privacy and other other aspects um, that may be, may be of concerns. And so one of the things, um, you know, kind of raising a lot of the opportunities and, and also some of the challenges, um, we can also talk about what we're doing here from, from headquarters to actually help some of these situations and help uh, improve the overall um, aspects. And one of the things uh, that we are focused on, and especially uh, both from within NASA headquarters and the overall federal government is open science. Um, and this is a principle and practice of making research products and processes available to all while respecting diverse cultures, maintaining security and privacy, and fostering collaborations, reproducibility, and equity. Um, there are many different aspects and many different um, uh, uh, ways to practice open science. Um, and you know, within this definition, we do try and actually capture um, those many different ways, uh, both in the products and the practices of um, how we actually carry out science. Within the Science Mission Directorate, um, we've set up oops, we've set up the Office of the Chief Science Data Officer. Kevin Murphy is the uh, lead of the office and the Chief Science Data Officer, and it has three goals: um, to develop and implement capabilities to enable open science, continuous evolution of data and compute systems, and to harness the community and strategic partnerships for innovation. Um, and we're aiming, these goals come out of our uh, document, which was developed and released in 2019 called the Strategy for uh, Data Management and Computing for Groundbreaking Science. Uh, this strategy was developed off of um, community input um, with a number of different um, activities and meetings to actually develop that input. Uh, and this is leading to much of the work that we're doing and, and uh, driving the type of work that we are trying to do. Um, and with a real vision of trying to enable, sci enable scientists um, to, or really focusing on ha having open science to help enable scientists reach their goals and, and objectives. Um, and we are focusing in three different areas, which include data and computing services, um, which are developing core data and computing services to enable open science. Data science and artificial intelligence, um, we're implementing innovative diets data science tools with a focus on inclusion and expanding the accessibility of scientific information, and the open science implementation. Uh, this includes policy development, education, incentives, and advocacy on open source software. Um, I'll talk a little bit about all three of these, uh, but certainly if you do want to know more, um, I'll be focusing on the open science implementation, but certainly happy to talk more about the other two as well. Um, and so one of the first things that the uh, Office of the Chief Science Data Office has done is uh, release SMD's new policy on scientific information. Um, this was released uh, uh, in um, December of 2022 now. Um, and so this is a science uh, mission directorate's policy on scientific information, or at, uh, often also to refer to as SBD 41A. Um, we're really looking at making sure that publications are made openly available with no embargo period that research data and software are shared at the time of the publication, that our mission data are released as soon as possible and is made freely available, that unrestricted mission software is developed openly. Um, it recognizes software as a scientific product, um, and it's also that it should be released with a permissive license. The data should be released with Creative Commons Zero uh, license and that software released with a permissive commonly used license. And it encourages using and contributing to open source software. Um, and so really actually focusing um, on uh, enabling uh, the openly availability of our, our information, but also on the processes uh, and making sure that, um, you know, that we're opening up science uh, from the very start of the processes all the way through uh, all, all the way through the different processes, uh, but also making sure that we're doing it in appropriate manners um, to actually balance off uh, the needs of the community um, while also minimizing the burden on our researchers. And so uh, one of the things, especially with software, we really want to lower the barriers for open source software. And we are working to make it easier to contribute to release and use open so source software. And this includes um, working with our um, different offices of uh, engineering and our offices um, of our general counsel, our legal counsel, 
to review the processes um, that are required to actually make software openly available from NASA, um, along with how we actually make sure that uh, different NASA personnel and projects can contribute and engage with the communities. And we're trying to make this easier and more straightforward uh, through updating existing NASA policies and providing more guidance on these aspects. We're also, one of the things that we um, have also done is um, provide sustainable support for open source software. Um, our first call on this was in ROSES 20, and in uh, 2021, we selected uh, 16 different proposals supporting 22 different projects uh, to support the open source uh, community. Uh, and this is with our ROSES um, open source tools, frameworks, and libraries call. Uh, ROSES 24 uh, OSTFL is now open. It opened on March uh, 4th. Um, it will close on June 7th. Um, and this call, um, I can talk more in detail about this call. We did have a um, town hall on it earlier this week. Um, and that uh, slides and the, uh, the slides are now available and the video should be available shortly. But this call particularly focuses on providing sustainable support to the open source community. We'll have two um, uh, types of award, one supporting foundational awards, which are um, uh, tools, libraries, or frameworks that are supporting the, um, uh, providing support uh, to two or more SMD um, divisions. Uh, but we also do provide also the sustainment awards, which can be focused on a single SMD division as well. Um, and so, uh, we're looking to provide $4 million per year in awards. Um, and so hopefully many of you are interested uh, in this call and I'm happy to take further questions on it. Um, we also have an upcoming uh, software for the Science Mission Director workshop uh, to explain, especially for those who are working on many of our missions or our centers or data repositories, um, to take a look at and, and talk about some of the opportunities and challenges around various life cycles uh, for software for relevant to activities funded by SMD. Uh, the workshop will be virtual with an in-person option uh, at NASA headquarters from May 7th to 9th, and virtual registration is still open. Um, and so hopefully many of you are um, maybe interested in this workshop as well. Um, we do also have other opportunities for what NASA uh, will fund and what other um, incentives uh, we do have. Uh, we do have our, our and I'm going to just, uh, in the interest of time, is, is kind of point out three of these, which are all no due date programs. And so they are always open, uh, which is our topical workshop, symposium, and conferences. Uh, we do actually uh, are interested in supporting open science um, events. Uh, this could include hackathons, uh, could include data challenges, could include discussions about best practices around open science and NASA science. Um, and so we do have funding to support opportunities um, to help support um, discussions around that. Uh, we also have our innovative uh, new ways to support open science, with, which is our F14 high priority open source science call. Uh, this is a no due date program and is always open. Uh, the idea with this is to support seed funding uh, for uh, different activities. And so it is at a level of about $100,000 for one year. And then we also have our supplement for open source science and cloud computing. Uh, this is for existing NASA grants uh, to actually provide a supplement to either further, further support open science or to provide credits for cloud computing. Uh, this is also always open and uh, available to those with an existing NASA, um, uh, NASA uh, grant. Uh, we do have two other ones, uh, which are cross-divisional and supported, um, uh, which is our citizen science seed funding, which is supported from the science engagement and partnerships branch, and our multi-domain reusable artificial intelligence tools, um, which is currently not open this year, uh, but hope to, to open that again soon. Our other activities um, uh, is also our core services, and just to mention um, what will be um, being carried out and the goals of our core services is provide foundation, uh, a foundational layer um, of architecture to help support open source science. Um, we do have, you know, there's a wider range of different things already being community developed in terms of citizen science, open source library contributions, and other value added products. 
There's also the work provided by our divisions in terms of um, archives and data repositories, uh, providing specific tools and services, our, uh, which include uh, things like data archiving and distribution, our mission data processing, uh, algorithm development, mission operations, or discipline-specific um, uh, open science training. But what Core Services is really focusing on is that lowest layer of um, providing that infrastructure needed for these different higher level layers to execute on. And this is by looking at providing hybrid computing environments um, to help actually address issues around cybersecurity, um, about data management in terms of, and cloud management in terms of things like egress, uh, user registration or metrics, um, and also around funding and billing of that. Um, and taking a look at how we actually combine those together with our high performance computing. Um, we, you know, and, and there are a range of different activities that can actually be supported by this um, from um, uh, combined scientific information management, collaboration tools, and also other additional um, opportunities in terms of uh, archives or repositories for our research data and software. Um, as part of these, we have a couple of different tools that we've already released, like the Science Discovery Engine, uh, which is providing search and discovery across uh, NASA data from all of our different divisions. Um, and so being able to actually discover related data uh, with a focus um, on uh, data being produced by any of our divisions. Um, we've also recently uh, released the Science Explorer. Uh, this is a literature-based um, open digital information system that actually covers all the different divisions uh, within uh, the Science Mission Directorate, including astrophysics, planetary science, heliophysics, earth science, and NASA space-based experiments. Uh, for those that are familiar with the ADS, uh, the astrophysics data system, uh, it is built on top of ADS, and so uses actually many of the same features, but provides a search and discovery of literature across all of our different fields. Um, it is already open and, and in operations along with the science discovery engine. And so these are two new tools um, being made available uh, to make our information openly accessible. And if you're not familiar with these, um, I do highly encourage you to check out um, the Science Explorer, uh, especially with, um, you know, uh, as it has been expanded to, to cover planetary science um, uh, along with um, our astrophysics and other fields. Um, and my understanding is it's it's already covering over 90, I think over 95% of planetary science publications. And then one, our one um, other major initiative um, that I'd like to actually uh, make sure to mention is our NASA's Transform to Open Science, or TOPS. Um, I know many of you already are involved or, or familiar with our TOPS um, uh, opportunities. Um, but for those who may not be familiar with it, um, we do know that um, open science may be new to many of you. And we do want to actually provide training and opportunities for people to actually engage um, with uh, open science and to actually learn about it and the different steps and processes of it. Um, and our TOPS program is our overall goal of actually um, increasing understanding and adoption of open science principles and techniques, broaden participation by historically excluded communities, and accelerate scientific discovery um, through adoption of open science principles um, by our different projects. Uh, in December, we did release Open Science 101. This is a community developed introduction to core open science skills. And so if many of the things around open science may not be familiar to you, um, this is a, an online um, course which is designed to help introduce you to them. If many of these things are very familiar to you, um, I will actually even admit, like there's stuff I learned by taking the course. And so there's a lot of great information in it um, that uh, um, I really highly recommend people taking a look at it. Um, there is a, a, an online course. There's also opportunities for virtual um, cohorts and also summer schools um, if you're interested in taking this in different uh, modes um, as you take a look at it. Um, and if you're already an expert, um, you know, if you complete the course, you also receive a NASA uh, TOPS Open Science uh, badge um, as part of it that can be um, shared as part of your ORCID or on other social media. Um, and if you are actually an expert already in these areas, you can fast pass uh, if you're actually just interested in, in getting the badge um, and, and um, uh, 
demonstrating your open science skills. One of the things that we do step through as part of the curriculum is open science and data management plans. Uh, these are a, a data management plans have been a requirement in Rose's uh, proposals, but open science and data plans are the expansion of that to cover um, a range of different open science skills as part of your proposals. And so the TOPS course does step you through that. Um, we've also made available other resources like our open science guidance for researchers, um, which is another resource uh, available for people uh, to take a look at as you're preparing your proposals uh, for NASA ROSE's solicitations. And then one other thing that we are also developing as part of TOPS is Science Core, and these are domain-specific curriculum for advanced data science skills. Um, one of the ones uh, we are, uh, uh, Sierra Brown is actually leading one of these, uh, developing one related to uh, planetary science. Um, and hopefully once those are ready, I, I would uh, think that would be a great, uh, something great to actually cover in maybe one of your future discussions. And so I think, and I know I went through these quickly because I wanted to actually make sure to leave time uh, for questions um, because I'm really interested in hearing about what you're interested in talking about. Um, I have made uh, hopefully the slides available and if not, I can share them in the chat and uh, want to just really thank you for your time and, and would love to, to hear what you're interested in talking about more about.